Hey guys, how's it going? Welcome to another episode of Ferris Makes Emulators. This is episode 44. I cannot believe I've almost done 50 of these. Uh, GUI Debugger Part 2, working on a little bit of graphical debugging things. Um, been a bit on the sicker side of things last little while, so I haven't been streaming as regularly as I would like. Uh, so sorry about that, but doing basically better now, except that uh, this Saturday I'm actually going to the US for work. Uh, and I happen to be flying back on Thursday, and then I'm going to a demo party next weekend, so I'm going to miss that as well. So the next three times when I would normally stream, I'm not going to, but the following Thursday should be, yeah, should be back on track, should be looking good. Uh, in the meantime, I thought today, um, I, w I, know, I know I wanted to continue on some of this graphical debugging stuff, um, and I thought about different kinds of things that I should do next. Um, particularly I thought like one of the things I really want to do pretty soon here is get some way to visualize um, the 32 different worlds that, that are being drawn for a given frame um, <clears throat> especially when we like pause stuff because um, it'd be really nice to see like which which worlds are being drawn where on the screen like I imagine I imagine sort of a list of these like on the right here and like hovering over them would show like where they are on screen with like uh, an outline and stuff on the this guy so I thought something like that would be cool um, but that might take a bit longer than what I have the time and focus to do today to be honest um, as I'm you know preparing to leave in a couple days too so I thought that I would try to do something else actually so I noticed uh, when I was hooking this stuff up last week this is actually pretty slow um, doing all the memory diffing and stuff here but I was thinking like um, this would actually be a really good place to use SIMD um, because we're basically doing the same operation on just a couple parallel buffers. Um, and yeah, I feel like it'd be kind of cool to explore SIMD and Rust with this kind of use case. Um, and then maybe if that goes well, we might also look into optimizing our video rendering later. Um, but yeah, just something I was thinking about because I thought that would be kind of fun. Uh, mainly because I haven't actually done SIMD in Rust. In fact, I haven't written any SIMD in C++ either. Um, just read a lot of it and read a bunch of it in Assembler as well. So should be able to get it working. Um, but yeah, I thought that could be kind of fun to start out with that. <coughs> Still a little bit snotty, <laughs> but we'll, we'll get through it. By the way, I had guys in the chat. Skeleton, Dura2, Metal Voids, Alkama, Kluosh, Dom170. Uh, Dan did I say Daniel Cullen all right? No, I did not. Daniel Cullen, the chief detector. Oh, comma. Full house today. Mad Moose. Tomix, what's going on? Hey, Zero Design. Daniel Cullen says SIMD isn't stable in Rust, just so you know, as far as I know. I should actually look into that. I still want to do it. <laughs> we'll check that. So basically what I was thinking, I'll let this play in the background because the music is lovely. Uh, just using this SIMD crate here in the wrestling nursery now. Hey, Mortaray. Um, so this, the, um, the main idea here is that we have these different types here that represent the kind of different things that we can pack into SIMD vectors. Um, and the idea is that you'd be, you'd be able to basically use these as you would any other sort of numeric types, except that it's just multiple values, like these are little vectors. And they also have some alignment constraints and other things, but like the container that we put these in, it's going to take care of all that. Uh, but the idea is that we'll just be able to use these directly. Um, and this will abstract the platform specific, uh, implementations of, of SIMD stuff. Uh, so on x86, it might use SSE or something. Um, I think these docs might be a bit outdated. Um, it seems to be missing some stuff. But anyway, uh, we should be able to get away with just by doing that. In fact, I'm thinking um, because these buffers, I think I only use like two components of the available space here. Um, but I want to keep them as U32s just for convenience. Or I think that's what I had them stored in. Maybe I didn't. We'll have to see. Uh, but depending on how we choose to do that, we can either use this U32 by 4 vector type or this U18 or U16 by 8 vector type and then process 4 or 8 pixels at a time doing this. So it should, 
should work pretty well. But I guess uh, when you guys are saying that the SIMD stuff is not in stable Rust, I'm guessing that means this thing here that all the types are marked with. Um, in fact, if we look at the source here, as far as I know, um, the SIMD attribute here um, just tells the compiler that this is, you know, represented as, as a SIMD type, uh, even though it has all of these different uh, components available. Uh, so it, again, will take care of things like alignment and yeah, all that stuff. Alignment being the main thing. <laughs> Thanks, Repnop. Yeah, it was actually really easy because all it, all it actually shows so far is just uh, the RAM here, work RAM, and then the video RAM here. Um, and it just in the red component, it shows the current value. And in the blue component, it has a value that whenever um, a change is detected from like a current snapshot of memory from the previous one, uh, it sets it to 255 and otherwise it'll just decrement it until it goes to zero. Uh, so it kind of shows us like how recently it was changed. <clears throat> but that's really all it is. It's just that in a separate window. Um, but yeah, it should be like the perfect thing to do for SIMD. Or put on a GPU, but I don't want to do that. <laughs> <coughs> but yeah, I think I think we should just be able to use this, even even if I end up reverting it uh, because this stuff is not um, stable. I would kind of like to play with this for my own sake as well because I've been wanting to play with this SIMD stuff in Rust <coughs> for some time now, and the compression stuff I'm working on also looks like it has a couple bits here uh, where this would be applicable. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, so let's just get started. <laughs> By the way, I'm using a super unscientific and unsound way to measure performance here. Uh, without the debugger, um, my task manager reports that this uses, the emulator uses about 7% CPU. With it, it uses about 11%. So that's a pretty significant increase um, just for showing the contents of memory over time. Um, again, that's a terrible way to measure. I'm being a bad example by, by mentioning it, but it's good enough for just the rough kind of stuff I want to do here. Really, the, the point is that I just want to get it to work first, and then we'll just use a super rough metric to see how much it helped. We can always um, profile and benchmark more properly at some other time. Um, but yeah, where'd my windows go here? So we're going to need to include this first. Uh, I always like to look at the source for which version it is. So it's 0.2.0. Drew 2, doesn't LLVM sim DIs already when optimizing? It might. Uh, it would need to check the, the disassembly uh, from actually compiling it. So really depends. I tend not to like to rely on that, actually, um, when we know that we can make something SIMD fairly easily. <clears throat> should just be able to do this, and that should compile at least. Going to make sure that works. Always like to take this stuff um, a step at a time. I'll just compile it first. <coughs> I mean, the thing is that if you can describe code with, with SIMD anyway, nice to be able to. My, in my experience, compilers aren't that great at doing automatic vectorization. They're really good at, at like particularly different kinds of mathematical transformations, but in terms of data flow transformations, I find that they're not not as impressive. Repnop, I totally checked that talk out. By the way, <laughs> God, we'll talk about the compiler explorer. It was called the. Um, what has your compiler done for you lately? That was a great talk. Watched that at work yesterday and today. So yeah, by the way, guys, CppCon just happened and they got a lot of really interesting stuff. I have yet to watch the one about, oh, I can't remember what it was called. It's queued up <laughs> at the office. Um, it's the one, I think it's about um, Atomics, about in Atomics and C++. I can't remember what it was, what it was called because a buddy of mine sent it to me. I haven't watched it yet. But anyway, that looked pretty cool. <clears throat> Dana Colin. <laughs> That's the perfect face. Ooh, we 
we gotta check that one out there too. Atomic C++ does sound like an Ace compiler name. From Borland, no less. All right, so I think here, so I just have vectors of U8s here. Uh, and I believe, right, so I actually do the axis colors as separate vectors here. That's probably bad, <laughs> but it, it'll be okay, I think. I mean, the main thing here is that we're going to have to iterate over all of these buffers anyway. Um, so in terms of the locality, it's really just important that we're reading like the the individual elements of each one in order because that, that will be good enough for our cache. So it looks like we can just keep these as U8s and then just store them. Or instead of having U8s here, we'll just have 8 by or 16 by 8 vectors. That should work. <clears throat> or do we have yeah u8 by 16 this is what we want um before i do that this guy let's put it here <laughs> everyone's atomic supposed to build exactly that's a new icon I think my Rust package got an update here. That's nice. <clears throat> yeah, the high frequency trading one I did watch, actually. That one was nice. Especially, I liked um, what that he really hammered on the fact that, uh, especially optimizing for performance, is really about being rigorous in measurement. And, like, you don't have to be an expert about how the how the language works or any of that. You just need to be able to get your compiler to do the right things and you need to be able to measure appropriately in order to know what the right things are to do and be able to to explore that. So I, I really liked that talk, especially for that. I think, think a lot of people forget about... The arm just came off my chair, by the way. <laughs> Hold up. <laughs> What I was going to say, <laughs> uh, a lot of time when people talk about optimization, they forget how important measurement is and just being rigorous about that and applying the scientific method. So I, re I just really liked his, his, uh, how much he hammered on that <laughs> and then showed a bunch of tricks and some good stuff. <clears throat> really great talk. But I, I mean, I also just like those kind of talks too, because it's like, it just felt like it was so no bullshit. Like, <laughs> here's here's what we do. This is what's important. It's just really grounded. Um, let's just try this. And then we'll do one of these. U8 by 16. So all these vex here. Uh, these ones. Zero pent, what's going on? Cyberpunky? <laughs> How's that? I'm just gonna do this, by the way. This is gonna be fine. Uh, but the the initial value is gonna be wrong. <clears throat> Oh, excuse me. Sorry. <laughs> uh, so I think we just need, is it splat that'll do this? Yeah, because we could do new with all the different values, but we want splat. Hopefully these things will also be clonable. Should be fine. Uh, so this should be U8 by 16 splat zero. Yeah, looks good. Look how easy this is, you guys. Nothing to it. <clears throat> Ripnop, that sounds like an awesome project.
please keep us updated about that. That sounds really cool. I would love to love to read that. <coughs> yeah, Jinx. Now, this is going to be a bit interesting. Uh, so this is where it's actually pulling out the WRAM. And ideally here, I would actually change the storage of the work RAM to also be SIMD vectors. Or at least actually just to be aligned so we could interpret it as SIMD vectors. In this case, I'm not going to do that. I'm just going to do um, this sort of slow way of doing this. So we're going to divide this by 16, I think. And we need to read out all of the different ones here to get the different values. Now I think, how do I want to do this? <clears throat> Chief detector. I, I was actually thinking that in my head. <laughs> oh, I love Bob Ross, by the way. So much fun to watch. When I was a kid, I used to think it was the most boring thing in the world. But like a couple years ago, um, I was homesick and I was watching it. It was when Twitch did that. They kicked off the creative thing and they had a whole marathon of Bob Ross. And I was just amazed. Like being older now and like understanding that making things takes a lot of work. <laughs> I, I was just, it was phenomenal how quickly he could do things. And like his, he's just such a, like, I don't know. He's just so mechanically adept at what he's doing. And he knows all these techniques for, for doing the thing that he does. So that, yeah, I just found that absolutely fascinating. <clears throat> happy little atomic integers <laughs> yeah when he was doing uh yeah the, like the wrecked and say a rip and saved and all that stuff and uh and he did the beat the devil out of his brush like watching the chat along with that marathon it was like like if you ever watch especially sgdq or like gdqs they keep doing the yeah ruin save that's what it was they keep doing the like the chat will just catch on an idea and then there'll just be a flood of all those I mean, the chat, especially in, in GDQ, is super toxic, but it is kind of funny to watch sometimes. And in particular, in this Bob Ross marathon, that was so, like, <laughs> quintessential Twitch chat. It was really, really funny. <laughs> really funny. Yeah, rip, yeah, that's what it was, Rip Devil, when he's beat the devil out of his brush. Oh, man. <laughs> oh, what a great, great marathon. Anyway, I love Bob Ross. <laughs> I also just like admire people who can take ideas and explain them in really like simple terms that make you feel like you can understand them even if you're not an expert. Like uh, I also love watching uh, Richard Feynman videos of him because he, he has a real knack for that. Just think that stuff's cool. <laughs> um, okay. So, because what we need to do here is we need to... This is going to be I over 16, and this actually needs to be I times 16. I'm thinking a really stupid way to do this. <laughs> yeah, I think I'm going to do this. <laughs> uh, this is going to be U8 by 16 new. We're going for it. <clears throat> e Eli five? Oh, explain like I'm five. Yeah, Cindy Cindy Vector Ops. Um, let's. <laughs> I guess I guess you know this more right, but maybe you don't. <laughs> I'd be surprised. But yes, I could explain that as if you guys were five. Uh, but the idea is that you have um, instead of just having like a U8 type, for example, we have vector types. So this is a 16 different U8s, and so we have all these different lanes where we can put different data. In particular, here I'm actually packing up a U8 by 16 from this thing where I can only read bytes, um, and that gives you this big old vector. Uh, and then the idea is that you can do like instead of just processing each one individually, you can process the whole vector as a whole unit. So you can do things like <laughs> the adder or two. Exactly. So, 
Uh, <laughs> uh, so you could do things like add two vectors and then you get basically 16 parallel adds at the same time. Uh, really, really great stuff. And modern uh, vector architectures can do weird things like swizzling and do, yeah, just absolutely crazy stuff. Um, in a modern, like, out-of-order execution CPU, of course, you have basically a bunch of different pipes that you could do this in. Sometimes they're vectors, but a lot, a lot of times they're separate pipes. And so really this gets compiled down to... I'm beyond the five-year-old thing here. Really this gets compiled to a bunch of different micro-ops that can all be dispatched, and hopefully they get dispatched in the same, same thing. So you want to watch your data dependencies. Getting ahead of myself here. <laughs> <clears throat> Skeleton, if you're talking about uh, string ops like STOSB and MoveSB, I did have those, and they're awesome. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I forgot about that, Dana Call. In SSC4, there's also some string ops in that capacity. <laughs> Stuff I was talking about is a lot older. But still very useful for size coding. Right, so here, this is where things will get interesting. So I'm gonna fix the WRAM view. Oh, I'm just gonna end up fixing them both at the same time. <laughs> um, interestingly enough, actually, the Virtual Boy CPU has some bit string stuff that also can do like compares and searches and hardware, which is a really weird feature. <laughs> Oh, cool, Rob. Nope, happy to hear it. If you need some retweets or whatever, let me know. <laughs> yeah, I wouldn't be surprised if those kind of instructions were just really strange. <laughs> <clears throat> no, no, no. Can't ban me for sign track. Er, I can't. I won't ban people from side tracking me too much. I would. I would ban someone for like harassment but I've never been harassed, <laughs> at least on this platform, in before being harassed, right? But no, sidetracking is fun. That's one of the reasons why I, why I do this. I like to be sidetracked. <laughs> this is my free time. It's fun. <laughs> nice one, Mordere. I do like how you've been how you've been sprinkling that in there more. <laughs> do, do you find that fake rivalry pretty funny? Oh, sick, Daniel Collin. That's really cool. Grumbins. <laughs> <clears throat> oh yeah, that's interesting, Dirt too. Didn't realize. But yeah, that's awesome, Daniel Collin. So cool that you have the opportunity to do that. <clears throat> so here I'm, I'm looking at this. And I'm already realizing something that I should have realized sooner. And what that is, is that I was thinking about using this, using SIMD for this stuff. But it actually looks like <clears throat> I have this this loop here that's both writing pixels to the buffer, which are aren't going to be SIMD vectors. Uh, and then it's also doing this update, so I can end up moving this update stuff where it checks like the does does the diffing with the previous snapshot and then also updates the last axis color. I can do those with SIMD, but then I'll probably have a separate loop that actually sort of copies those into the pixel buffers. Um, I think, yeah, I was hoping to do the whole thing with SIMD, but unless I change some storage elsewhere, it's going to be a bit tough. But I think doing this in two separate loops is not going to be too bad anyway. Um, be a bit hurt by the bandwidth here, but it's not going to be too bad. I still think it'll end up faster, though, because we're... We're actually using these accesses more effectively. Anyway, the nice part about that, though, is we should actually be able to bake it into this loop. 
And then maybe we don't even need these two different buffers. Because we really just need the new value and the old one. I think that works out. And then we're just going to copy data from the new one. That's actually cool. Let's explore that. Oh, that's cool, Danny Colin. Currently, I don't have any way to get that array from the VRAM or the WRAM. I could expose that, though. But I think I'll go with this for now. But that would be better in the long run. <coughs> because even, even an unaligned access or an unaligned load is still going to be better than doing this packing by hand. Yeah, so this would be like this, but this isn't what we want to do yet. We want to do this. Oops. Basically this, and then we want to both update the new values like this, and we also want to calculate the new values for the the differences here. Now I haven't actually checked at what we have available for these vector instructions, so may have to dig in a bit here. And if we hit a wall and this wasn't a great idea, I'm fine with that. I don't really care. As long as we gave it a shot, <laughs> then I'm pretty pretty satisfied with trying this. Like I said, this is the first time I've ever tried to use this SIMD stuff in Rust, so I'm really just happy to hang out and try this. Um, <clears throat> so let's sort of change this here. I think I did this. We'll, we'll call this bytes and last bytes to match the other one. Um, oh, nice, Mr. Liquid. That would be great. So bas basically what we want to do, um, and I'm going to change this so that it writes this on every every pixel, because it's going to be likely enough. I think, that, think that'll make the most sense. So effectively, we'll get to that. So here we have our byte and our last byte. We want to do this. Oh yeah, so I'm already writing it anyway. So that's good. But for every lane, we want to check if they're the same or different between these two vectors. And if they are, we want to basically do conditional loads here with either the last value or this new value or or sorry, the last value minus one or zero or 255. This might even get a little interesting. <clears throat> so let's do this. Yeah, I'm not going to click that link now. <laughs> Actually, I'll click it and save it for later. 
Because I'm super interested in reading about that, but no way I'm going to go through that now. <laughs> Estimated read time. That's actually cool. I'm really curious what stuff like I imagine we'll have some comparison stuff. Might have to bear with me here while I dig through this a bit. <clears throat> oh yeah, here we go. We have, for example, these greater than, less than ones here, which will give us bools. But then what, would I, what I really wanna do, what I'm thinking basically, I'm actually gonna check that by the way, the standard SIMD thing. So I didn't realize this was not the newer one. <laughs> ah, here it is, the top one on the list here. I think I think right now this is not going to be what I want to use today. But yeah, it looks it looks like we can get these like equality and stuff into so we basically take this and something else for example we could do compares um of I think we have byte and last byte. So for example, we can say Um, like this and then for every lane we have we're going to get booleans here and then what I want to do is do some conditional moves here um, and some conditional subtracts for example and I don't know if we'll be able to do that well I would, I would imagine we would have seen something like that here. <clears throat> and it could be that that's not the right way to do this either, but I imagine that's how you'd want to do this. Oh, yeah, and here's the load store Daniel Cohen was talking about. Nice. Yeah, here it goes. This is equivalent to the following, but possibly more efficient. <laughs> nice. Yeah, these are just operators here. In fact... Yeah, it's not gonna give me what I want. Just to be sure, I'll check if the 
Oh, this didn't give me the source I wanted. <clears throat> ah, okay, so this is how they're implementing that. Right. This guy. Select looks like is what we want to do. Is that documented here? No. Well, maybe it's on the bool types. That would make sense. Yeah. Okay. This is exactly what we want here. <clears throat> this is perfect. So what this will do is it'll we give it we give it basically two options. So we have this this thing where all of our lanes are booleans, and then we have like a vector of true what we want all the things to be that are true and a vector of all the ones that we want to be that are false and it looks like we can call the select function with the other two values and it'll just sort of yeah pull in the ones that are yeah from the left and the right so in this case that's almost what i want completely because there's going to be one last thing here we want the ones that are different and we want the ones that are zero here. The ones that are greater than zero. So I think we have to do this. And can we do this? No, it didn't like this. I think we have to do greater than. Okay. Got to think through this stuff a little bit. <laughs> what it does per lane is not going to be that difficult. Maybe if I think of it that way, it'll be a little simpler. <clears throat> but yeah, so we have, we have the current bytes. We have the last bytes. We have the last access color. And we have, to, we have to output the new access color, right? So it's going to be something like this. Um, I think we can basically just take a bit mask of these two things here and then select between a couple different values. So <laughs> you ate. By 16 splats 255. <clears throat> this. Yeah, we'll not worry about that these are the same yet. And then. I just need a temp here. Uh, 
All right, what is this? So if the bite is different than the last bite, then it needs to be 255. The thing is that I have a couple different conditionals here. So basically if it's different bites, then we want 255. Otherwise, if the this, then we want this minus one, otherwise zero. <clears throat> so maybe if we sort of do it that way. I think we can just combine this like if like we can do this conditional and then this conditional and I think that makes it a lot easier so then we can do let temp is this one select so if it is greater than zero then we can do this one Otherwise, it'll be zeros. Whoops, I wanted the last color. And it makes sense. And then we can take that and do the different bytes thing. If the bytes were different, we're just going to override it. So then we can do this. <clears throat> uh, it's going to be ISU size is that select. And so if they are different, we want the 255s. Otherwise, we want temp. I think that's it. come up with a nicer way to write this. But I think this will work. Um, and then we need to be able to unpack this to actually put it in the buffer. And in this case, actually, this um, the thing Daniel Collin mentioned here with the store is actually going to be perfect. This is definitely what we want to do. Um, we do want to interleave these, but we can totally do that should be able to do that with other vectors, particularly because the buffer is a bunch of U32s. We want to be able to sort of unpack these into, into U32 equivalents. Uh, so we'll basically do these exact same shifts, I think. Oh, my mouse decided not to work for a second. This is weird. I can click, but I can't move my mouse. <laughs> what the hell? Guys. Try streaming. You will discover hardware problems you did not know you had. I guarantee you that. Your chair falls apart. Your mouse decides to be a butt. All right, we're good. <clears throat> um, so this is our buffer index, uh, except this is going to be divided by eight now. As far as I know, we're getting the... Did I remove a line here? Where's it getting that byte from? I must have. Yeah, I must have moved that up here. <laughs> yeah, if only I had Emacs. I'm also, by the way, I'm going to do this really quick. <laughs> We're going to get to this, but it should it should be basically identical. But we'll do we'll do one at a time, so it'll be a little easier. 
Also, this is total crap now. We don't need to swap the buffers. So what we should do here, we'll, we'll get the buffer index. Uh, we'll do this divided by 16, because that's how many we're doing at once here. Um, in fact, that's, is that the right way to place to do this? I think we do, yeah, because here I'm doing the individual pixel plotting. We're going to assume that this is correct, though. Was it was this the syntax to step by 16 in Rust, or was it something else? I don't remember what that is. <clears throat> but actually, the Y needs to be the same. And in the X, we can step by 16 pixels each time. I mean, we could just do this. <laughs> and that's fine. This should work out for the buffer index. Let's go with that. And so we'll do... Um, <clears throat> we'll call these blue. <laughs> uh, and then we'll get the reds from the actual bytes. And then to mix these, it should actually be really simple because we should just be able to take colors is bytes, shift left, 16, or blues. And I actually expect the compiler to just be able to handle that with our vector types. Um, and then we'll have all these colors in this one lane, and then we should be able to write it out here with this store thing. So it should be colors.store and then we have self.buffer with this index. <coughs> oh, the step by thing, yeah. Is that not stable? I actually feel like I remember doing that. Okay, yeah, it's not stable. <laughs> Let's go with this then. Bit easier. Hey, Power USB. You which type did it not infer? Uh, first of all, this. Get rid of that. Ha, <laughs> that's so cool. Uh, is it this that I did wrong? If I just build it. <clears throat> it should know the type of this. Oh, you know what? We need to expand this actually. Um, because these are, these are still gonna be 16 by U8s. That's actually not gonna work because we need to get these as U16s and then we're not gonna be able to do 16 at a time. Because we need to basically swizzle these. Again, interesting here. Yeah, so I made the mistake of thinking that these this would just work, which is totally wrong. 
which is great. These are the kind of pitfalls I want to hit when I'm doing this. This is how you learn. But yeah, so I have all these um, U8 by 16 vectors. You need to somehow get this to, <clears throat> I might actually have to unpack and repack, but I don't think I should have to do that. Yeah, we should have some conversion types. Although these might just give us different types here. Because I would imagine that a lot of these would give you a vector of like the same size. Also, this is SC2, but that's something else. Oh wait, what is this add S thing? That's add. Yeah, I don't think we'll be able to do this conversion without perhaps storing and then loading a different way. <clears throat> basically we have to do this four pixels at a time with one of these u32 by four types we could do we could do the packing ourselves that would be fine i think It'd be a bit annoying since they don't align, but it should be okay. We almost want to do let's because we have to pull these both out. Because we do, we do have these indexed things here uh, to extract with the different lanes. So we can use that at least. Yeah, I think that'll be okay. <clears throat> Basically do this for i in zero to four, because four by four is 16. We'll do something like this. Let's do the same names here. Or sorry, that's maybe I got that wrong. Is it extract? Yeah, that's what I wanted to do.
This won't be that pretty, but it'll be okay. Um, do something like this. <laughs> We're going to lose all the benefits of doing this here. It's going to be fine, though. And then we need to do the same thing for... Uh, those reds, by the way. Then the blues. Which are going to be our... Through our MX blues here, even. Whoops. Wrong ones. Rest should basically work. It's not entirely sure what it complains about here, though. Maybe, maybe it, I wrote the word buffer and that's the wrong field. No, it is buffer. <laughs> yeah, but <laughs> that chat totally became suck overflow. No worries. I don't mind. But what in particular is it having trouble with? Because this should infer, just to be sure. Okay, so maybe that was the issue. And then just to be sure here, I think we got to do plus i times 4. Which part didn't like here? So I think this should work. <laughs> um, <clears throat> not as pretty as I thought it might be. But if it works, I'll be pretty happy. So it looks like we have the right data alignment. But clearly... The fact that it's changing all these all the time is definitely wrong. So mess up the logic there somehow. <coughs> it does seem like it's using less CPU, but I might be reading into that a little too early. <laughs> nice rev knob. <laughs> uh, I'm guessing I'm, I'm just, I just made this wrong. Oh yeah, because this is uh, not, we want not equal here. Chief detector, right on the money, right at the same time. Actually, technically you got it earlier because of stream delay. So I'll give you that one. <laughs> now it's looking more friendly. Guys, you just witnessed a historical moment. The first vector code I ever wrote. Except GPU code, but... <laughs> first SIMD code I wrote in Rust. Pretty happy about that. Almost had it right first time. For first try. <laughs> Great, this totally works. I'm happy about that. Uh, let's do the VRAM now as well. Uh, also, another thing I want to do here. Um, 
actually we'll leave this as is for now and I'll get to why. <laughs> um, I think I can just do basically copy this because I think the other one just changed some values anyway. Yeah, 512, 512 here and 40 here. Is this gonna cause a couple issues? Yeah, I could consider measuring more properly. All I'm doing is I'm looking at the CPU usage in Task Manager, which again, totally horrible. But it's it's enough to get a general idea in this case. I'm just gonna do this the ugly way. I think it's just this. Great. And then this first loop has changed. But I actually, one of the things that I actually like about this is it forced me to break up these loops into loops that actually make more sense broken up. I don't know if that's something. By the way, let's call this last access color. And we have where this was used here. And this needs to be VRAM and VRAM access color. And yeah, also these are gonna be different. What was my code before? Git diff. is right at the start of the address space. Nice. Ah, sorry, Repnop. I need to add you to that whitelist, actually. Ooh, and I got a crash. Which is an index out of bounds. We'll fix that in a sec. <clears throat> By having to add a bunch of people to the whitelist, I'm still satisfied with doing that. There you go, Repnop. That's that should be fixed. Where was my access violation here? Oh, here. Yeah, according to my really unscientific measuring, 
This is actually a hell of a lot faster. About, about twice as fast, according to my unscientific measuring. <laughs> so I would average about 7% CPU without the debugger and about 11% with the debugger, which is about 4% difference. And right now it's averaging about 9%, a little bit less. So that would make this about twice as fast. Again, really unscientific way to measure. But I actually, those measures, like just since I've been eye eyeballing those recently, um, they actually seem to be accurate enough for this. It's also extra bad because a lot of my CPU is being used for like stream encoding stuff. But I think, I think that's good enough to eyeball for this. I mean, I'm just happy we had a noticeable difference. <laughs> I will say though, the code did get less readable. Um, we can have a look. Actually, I want this to run in the demo mode because I want, I'd want i like to watch this run. <laughs> but yeah, the code definitely got less readable and I think it's mostly due to the conditionals. Um, if we go here, like this stuff is obviously not that pretty. Um, can definitely do that better if I just expose the buffers. In fact, that might even get a nice little speed up, so I might do that. Um, here, like basically this stuff here, where it's like the different bytes and then the different kind of packed values here that we kind of have to pass around. That's not very pretty. And especially how I have to do this, where I basically always calculate the result of this and then select them with the result of this. Um, I think it's kind of a nice way to do that when you think about the data flow. Um, and that's why it works in this case is because that's that's kind of, I think, I don't know if it's the SIMD friendly way to do it, but it's definitely a SIMD friendly way that I would think to do it. Um, it's the kind of stuff you would, you would do in shader programming as well. That's kind of where I got the idea to do that. Um, but it, yeah, not, not as pretty. I could probably sit here and make it prettier. But yeah, according to my own scientific measurements, it's definitely faster. <laughs> and, I, and I'm not surprised by that because like this is the kind of thing that would lend itself to this kind of processing. So I'm, I'm satisfied with that. It is nightly only. Don't know how I feel about that at the moment. Just for the heck of it, let's go ahead and expose these values. Um, all I really need to do is just make some stuff public in the core. Yeah, that's probably what I'll do to her too. <clears throat> So particularly, we want to, okay, yeah, this is why I didn't want to do that. I currently have this set up as, as pointers because I think I was doing this. Yeah, so I create a vector so we have ownership of it, and then I use a pointer here when I actually access it. This does actually help, by the way. Now, it would actually be fine still if I exposed the vector version of this. That would still be okay. Would mean some unsafe stuff here. Nah, I think that'll be okay. I did this for performance reasons, by the way. And I did this in a couple places, but I think it's okay. There, there are certain certain places with this language where I'm just fine with doing that. And this is one of them where profiling did show that as a bottleneck. See you, Repnop. Have fun. <laughs> Cobol, even. Um... Yeah, so that'll expose the VRAM, and then here we want to do make this make the VIP public as well. Um, and then this should become quite a bit nicer, actually. 
because we should basically be able to do u8 by 16 load. And I think we can do virtual boy dot inner connect dot vip dot vram. And that's i by 16. I think that's what we do. And then we'll want to do wram as well. Do the same thing here. Just make bytes public. Yes, good enough. And then here, we should be able to do the same thing. U8 by 16 load. Virtual boy interconnect RAM bytes. Reference to that. I by 16. And I, I don't really mind exposing this stuff either. Probably didn't expose the WRAM here. Yeah. I don't really mind just making this stuff public. Like, in, in a way, I kind of want it private so that we're not skipping over some, um, some abstractions I've done here, like reading and writing bytes from this. I kind of like that there's an abstraction there. Um, and in a way, it kind of doesn't keep us from doing that. But at the same time, I also want all of this to be really introspectable. I don't know. But yeah, that definitely makes it a lot better. Also, now we don't need the memory map thing here. That's pretty cool. <clears throat> I could offer a stream API. I think in this case, um, maybe a way to just get the storage as a slice would be more appropriate. Because then, then actually, I like that idea. <laughs> uh, especially one that you can only read. Then we can do something like this. This I like actually, because it's still, you can't write it this way. And it's also more convenient to use read byte if that's actually what you wanted to do. So I think this is a good compromise. And then making this, making like on the interconnect, making that stuff public, uh, like these objects, that, that I don't care if they're public. That doesn't hurt anything at all. Um, See, so yeah, I'll, I'll do that with the VRAM as well. I think that's a good middle ground. Because the stream stream isn't as useful when the slice is what we actually need. As long as we can just get an immutable reference to that, I think that's okay. Do the same thing here. Uh, it's it's a it's a pair of both a reference to the data and also the length of the data. That's what the, the slice is. It's a, it's a pointer length pair. Um, yeah. And you have a lot of these, these things where you can do, oops, this is actually VRAM is what we wanted here. I have a lot of these things where like a vector can just give you a slice really easily by just yielding its pointer and its size in a pair. Um, and then you borrow that. That's pretty cool. So then in this case, this becomes really easy to fix because we just do this and we're going to get an error down here, which we do this. That's pretty nice. <clears throat> yeah, that's exactly it. You know, Colin, that the, the idea is that the compiler can do bounce checks. And if you want to get around those, you can cast it to a pointer and do unsafe code, which sometimes is what you do. 
Very rarely is it what you do in Rust, but sometimes it helps. There's not really a noticeable... Actually, there is a speed up there. Not much, like half a percent on average, averaging like eight and a half percent CPU. Again, really unscientific. I have to say that every time. <laughs> Not too bad. Oops, wanted to get into the demo mode. Actually, let's do a bound high games cooler. <laughs> I think, I mean, I think it just, as a game like this should, I don't think it's actually very exciting to watch what happens in the VRM viewer. Because it just uses the hardware, like, as the hardware should be used. Now I want this to go into demo mode too. <laughs> oh, but it's so cool to see this and I'm really just happy that this that this worked. Yeah, Dura 2. I think storage-wise, that's exactly what it is. And in fact, in Rust, you can, if you have a string, you can get a slice to its bytes. So that's pretty similar. But really, so the data type itself is the pointer length pair, and then when you index on it, then you get bounce checks. That's the idea. Yeah, the change thing's really cool. It's it's really trivial. I actually think it goes too slowly. I might have to adjust that. It fades out a bit too slow. <laughs> I don't know if it was supposed to keep playing that sound effect. Yeah, I don't remember that either, Drew, too. But I think you're right. But yeah, I think as far as SIMD code as well, I think this even got a little sloppy. Like this is not very pretty. Um, but I like this. I like this quite a bit. We can just do the exact math it describes and this is actually happening on four channels rather than one. That's pretty cool. Um, and this did get, this did look a lot nicer with the different loads and stores. <laughs> I would of course say do it chief detector I think I think this was fun I think I think this by the way is all I'm going to do today it's already 9 30 uh, so I'm going to stuff this on a branch shouldn't be any real surprises here the thing is though if I ever merge these to master I got to be really careful with the licensing I'll just add a note in the commit message. Actually, I'll do this on a branch first. I'm actually surprised that's not nested yet. But I guess it would affect a lot of the library because you'd, you'd have a lot of entry points that would 
where where you would want to get a span, for example. So I, I could see if it's not standard for that reason. But the other thing I like about this, um, this logic was actually kind of fun to do with the select thing. Um, and I also like that none of this is platform specific when you write this out. Like in the worst case, this could totally just be compiled to scalar code and it would be fine. But yeah, it's kind of nice that there's no platform spe specifics here. And we still got some kind of speed up. And I, th I do think this is fairly readable. I just think that this could be... I gotta come up with a way to, to note this, I guess. Maybe some better names. A lot of this stuff, too, can totally be lifted by the compiler. So, like, these two things, for example, are totally constant within the context of this algorithm. So, this this one as well. Like, these are the same. This one too. So I'd imagine a lot of those would get lifted. But yeah. Anyway, I think I'm going to head out. Uh, this was fun, guys. Um, yeah, next three streams I'm not going to do because I'll be traveling. Uh, so Sunday, Thursday, next Sunday won't be available. But after that, the following Thursday, um, I will be available. I want to do a little bit more on this before moving on to some of the fuzzing stuff that I've been talking about, but I'm still thinking about that in my head, so we'll hopefully get to that pretty soon. Anyway, thanks guys for hanging out, and I will see you next time.